going to live stream the webinar. This meeting is being live streamed. Got it. Cool, cool, cool. And there we are. It's not live right now because we're in the practice session. But once I hit start webinar, which is now, it will be live. Woo! Thank live you, stream everyone. Webinar. This meeting is being live streamed. Got it. Cool, cool, cool. And there we are. Hello, welcome. Um, for those of you joining live on our YouTube, very exciting. This is a first for Nation Builder and hopefully many more lives to be coming. And I think we have a couple of folks trickling in on the participant side. So I will keep that open as folks join. And as folks are joining, if you would like, please feel free to pop into that little Q&A box and let us know where you're coming from. Wherever you are in the world, we want to say welcome and thank you for being with us. And we will get started in just a minute. I'll give it some time for folks to join. Okay. All right. Will be as prompt as possible. So it's 101. So I'm just going to kick us right off. Uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, conversation on how is it that Giving Tuesday can actually be every day? And what does it look like for Giving Tuesday to be a part of your strategy all year round when it comes to giving? So I would firstly like to welcome and introduce our amazing panelists today. We have Kieran Britton, Community Fundraising Specialist at Protect Our Winters. And Kieran's going to be sharing her experience with the Protect Our Winters group and what fundraising and their fundraising strategy has meant to their community as a whole. We've got Mark Bogutman, who is a fundraising expert from Nation Builders Enterprise Sales Team with over 15 years of experience in fundraising, philanthropy, and major gift giving. Mark's going to be able to share some of the practical tips and strategies that he has seen throughout his work over the last 15 years. And last but definitely not least, we have Erica Rissi, who is Nation Builders Community Manager. Erica has worked in nonprofits all over the Iowa region, and she has been with the Nation Builder team working as that vital link between our community and Nation Builder staff. And she's going to be able to share some insights on what she saw in the nonprofit space, but also what she has been seeing with the Nation Builder community over the past few years. I am Sorsha. I'm your host for today. For those of you who've been in the Nation Builder community for a while, you have seen me knocking around. Uh, I've been with Nation Builder for the last eight plus years, and I head up our organizing department. So I have the absolute privilege of getting to work with our customers and partners all across the world. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to be here and convening this group today. So some of you might be asking, what the heck is Nation Builder? So we were founded by organizers for organizers, and we were created with this deep belief that everyone can lead, everyone. And our founders set out with this goal of making the tools of leadership available at an affordable price to people all over the world. And as our platform has grown and evolved, fun fact, Nation Builder's birthday was yesterday. Uh, October 31st was the first sign of code written, and so we turned 14. So we've done a lot of growing and evolving in those 14 years, and we've had the luxury of providing leadership solutions to countless political campaigns, candidates, right? That's pretty traditional. That's our bread and butter. But we've also been able to work with amazing nonprofits, association groups, higher education organizations, corporations, small charities all across the globe. Ultimately, we are a mission-driven software company, and we hold a deep belief that solving humanity's unprecedented challenges will occur only with the participation and leadership of millions of citizens around the world. We have a technological infrastructure to make participation and leadership possible at scale. In the words of our founder, Jim Gilliam, democratize democracy. So since 2011, we have served over 100,000 customers in over 129 countries, from individuals stepping into leadership for the first time, to global non-profit, profits, there we go, profits, heads of political parties, international networks, charities, and Fortune 500 companies. And we do that with our software. Our software contains five core pillars of the platform. We have our database, 
functionality. We have our website functionality. We have our communication suite, which incorporates texting and emailing. We have our fundraising suite. And then lastly, we have our advocacy suite. And all of those speak to each other to create Nation Builder. So there's my intro and all the words. And I now want to go into a panel conversation with these wonderful humans. So just to kick us off, I'm going to ask each of you, what does Giving Tuesday mean to you? Mark, take the stage. What does it mean to you? Uh, well, Giving Tuesday to me, um, it just looks like an opportunity for us to change our orientation. You know, we think of Giving Tuesday as uh, something that follows one of the um, biggest consumption holidays of the year after Black Friday. And it was a way, I think, that um, the nonprofit community, the philanthropic community was like, you know what, we're going to radically push back on that. We want to create an opportunity for people to give as strongly or uh, as forcefully as we consume. And um, so Giving Tuesday to me looks like uh, during the holiday season, a way for us to really get in touch with the heart of philanthropy, um, which I think is one of the things that the holiday season is really all about. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I always forget the connection with Black Friday. Um, Karen. I love this question because there has been this question in my mind as of late as to why Giving Tuesday is after we've spent all our money. <laughs> and so my thought with Giving Tuesday is not only is this, this exactly what Mark said, this beautiful opportunity to come together to create change after such a consumeristic mindset, but also I think it's this beautiful opportunity and the theme of today's webinar is just so on point that it doesn't have to be after we've given all of our money, it becomes this opportunity for change and opportunity to take it even further. So I think Giving Tuesday is this reminder that we have so much impact when we come together, especially on a day. And I love the conversation about how we can do it in a way that maybe is not second thought to us spending money first. So I'm excited for today, but Giving Tuesday is definitely an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Why is it after? That's okay. Erica, what do you, what does it mean to you? Well, to follow up, I mean, I'm loving your words, um, especially the word opportunity. I feel like depending on however nonprofits want to take their campaign, whether it is fundraising, trying to gain those dollars, or even if it's, you know, recruitment, brand advocacy, anything, it's just an opportunity to connect to people, even bring people into something you care about so much and share about why you do what you do every day. Um, and I, I Kira, of course, I love what you're saying about how it's not just something that can happen one one day out of the year, but something that really could be transferred every single day. So gosh, Giving Tuesday, what an opportunity. So given what you just shared, Karen, in particular around it being an opportunity and it doesn't necessarily have to be the one day, what does it look like to keep supporters engaged year round in the idea of giving? I love this because this is exactly what my role specifically with POW, Protect Our Winters Canada, has developed into. Um, so I come from a very fundraising community background. My belief is that we are not asking for funds from donors. We're not asking for funds from members. We are asking for funds from people and people want engagement. They're not just going to turn around and give you funds. So keeping people engaged on different levels is just so important. And to me, it is this funnel, this ladder of engagement that allows for people to be engaged and active within your community. To me, a, a donor, a supporter, a funder, can be a volunteer. They can be someone that attends an event. They could be really anyone that has a touch point. And then that linear approach, that linear model of where we approach them in different avenues so that they can feel engaged with the nonprofit is so important. You'll see today we've got people walking around, buzzing around because we have a fundraising event tonight. And that fundraising event is a climate advocacy conversation and film night. It is our season opener. We are starting 
starting this the winter season with ski films and people are going to be bringing their um, skis and snowboards to get waxed here at the Mex store. It is all about community. It is all about excitement. It is all about bringing people in and allowing them to feel an emotional connection with what we do. And that's where our value alignment will be. And then we just continue that engagement forward. A lot of our funding is through events that celebrate the individual, challenge the individual and allow them to have fun within their community. And I think that that's where we see such strong um, communities popping up in all of our chapters across Canada, because we really engage our people in such an intimate and individualized manner. So that's kind of how we approach it. It's, it's less of how is this individual siloed within our approach, but more so this is an individual, let's engage them and let's connect with them on our value set. And I think that that is just, it's so important when you're approaching fundraising in that way, where it's, it is really a community coming together. Mm. Putting people at the center is everything that I heard in in what you shared there and is a really core value of, of mine personally and, and also Nation Builders. Mark, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this idea of like, it's a person, it's not a donor, it's not a volunteer, it's a human. How does that show up when you're thinking about major gifts and kind of the experience you've had in the, in the political, in the political, in the nonprofit space? Yeah, no, uh, thanks, uh, Karen, for sharing that. And uh, especially fun to think about that event. I definitely kind of, I want to put that on my calendar for next year. Um, so I can be in the office experiencing that buzz. But um, one of the things that I heard you say that I really loved is, you know, one of the worst things that can happen in an organization is that groups begin to operate in silos in general. Um, you know, when when that happens, it can happen in fundraising. I've seen it uh, a number of times. And, um, you know, fundraising can become something that people look at as uh, a means to an end, like it's the thing that enables the mission, but that's not actually how philanthropy works. It's actually kind of the opposite, like gifts that come in are that lagging indicator of the quality of the relationships that you've formed with your donors over time. And so, um, you know, in an organization, there are, you know, different layers, there's board members, there's staff, there's uh, program participants, there's patrons, and everyone has an important experience and an important voice. And so philanthropy can really become a very important democratizing experience where everyone has equal playing field. And so the thing that matters most to me when I look at an organization is what is the culture of philanthropy within the organization? Um, those cultures kind of evolve naturally. It doesn't matter kind of where you are. It, it, they happen in regions, they happen in companies, they happen in families or in friendships. And so the best leaders raise the bar of the quality of those cultures. And so the quality of your philanthropic culture is something that's really important to pay attention to um, and to really nurture. Um, it's worth the time to do that. Yes. The idea of culture and, and putting people at the center to me are just inextricably linked. Um, thank you both for, for sharing that. Erica, I'd love to hear from you on your experience within the nonprofits locally and how like donor engagement showed up. How did you all see people as individuals? I feel like especially with a local um, nonprofit and charity, you have a little bit of more of an ease, but maybe that's an assumption I'm, I'm just making. Well, it's such an interesting idea. As I was thinking about Giving Tuesday coming up, I was thinking about my experiences and what it was like to really try to emphasize whatever campaign we were rolling with that year. And I do remember it just feeling so competitive and challenging, getting your message out there and, and hoping that it could reach all these new people felt so hard. And we really had to lean on our personal contacts and where we remembered leaving those relationships off at, whether it was a phone call or an email, passing by in the community, maybe a text on a team member's, you know, a thread from them. So gosh, so challenging. Um, and I just think what it would be like. And now, you know, my role looks so different. It looks like advocating for actual equipment to give teams the tools they need to be able to do this, to optimize their time. Um, maybe even, you know, answer some challenges they didn't even know had answers to them. 
And so I just think that there's such an opportunity to, gosh, emphasize, yeah, any campaign, rally recruiters, uh, raise the funds, all the things. Yeah. You bring up a really interesting point though, right? There's a lot of different levers to pull when you have a community. And if you're asking for money or if you're asking them to volunteer, if you're asking them to fundraise. And a thing that I've heard in the space over the past couple of months is this idea of donor fatigue or just fatigue in general, right? And whether that's fatigue and I can't give money and there's a whole emotional kind of thread that you can look at for donor fatigue, but there's also fatigue in I'm being asked to give in so many different ways because the world is a scary place. So how can I make change? How can I actually do an impact? I'd love to hear, Kieran, is there any kind of experience that you've had with your community with this idea of fatigue and and how to overcome it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have discussions on our side regularly about what is fundraising for POW and even just coming at it as a person that's experiencing it myself. I mean, we get asked for money all the time, whether it is shopping, whether it is email ads that are telling you about some discount and now is the time to buy, or it is support and and help change the world and so much is going on we feel as individuals as human beings we feel the heaviness of a global impact at this point and and on top of that we then have our local concerns and then our individual concerns and that's a lot of weight on our shoulders as human beings and at the end every single person is a human being experiencing it and we really had to understand what is fundraising on POW side? And we are still navigating that and, and building this out. But what we want to do, especially because we are in climate advocacy and we recognize that this is not about changing light bulbs so that you're more efficient or making sure that you are recycling at your house or you have a compost at your house. Those, those efforts are amazing. But it is about policy and bigger changes that we're focusing on. So when we're talking about boiling that down to the money that's even coming in, we don't want the weight of everything to be on the individual. We want the weight of everything to be on the the larger entities. The change is going to come from those larger entities as well. So what we are really focusing on when it comes to fundraising are events and film nights, things that boost the community, things that challenge the community. We love seeing when somebody is cycling, um, a gentleman and his wife, he cycled, um, I think it was 700 kilometers in a week and he raised funds for POW doing it. And then his wife was hiking this incredible, I, I, I can't really remember the details. It was a little while ago, but it was a GoFundMe campaign, right? Where there was a challenge, there was adventure. And that was so aligned with who we are as a community and what we're doing. And, and so those are the efforts of fundraising that we love to focus on. Things that inspire, things that encourage community connection, that get us all hiking and biking and adventuring together, yogaing together. And then we see these individuals doing these incredible fundraising efforts where they're taking on a personal challenge and then we celebrate them and amplify them within our community and and build this connection that's where we're starting to see fundraising really come to life and i think the important question for any organization to ask is what does this look like for you how is this unique to you how does this boil down to your baseline because even when we look at the change we want to make as POW, we want to be influencing policy and having big discussions and celebrating the individual because it is not, it's not about perfection. It's about progress for the individual. So um, yeah, that's kind of how we've approached it is really kind of having those moments of celebration within our community and, and inspiring. And that's been really successful for us, but taking that second to sit back and think about what does fundraising look like for us? Are we um, the type of organization that has really successful one-on-one relationships? So donor fundraising is really important, um, or maybe something through a gala, or maybe something through raffles, or what have you. Everyone is different, but understanding exactly how that aligns with an organization's core 
and their efforts is so important before you just start throwing darts and yeah. seeing what sticks. I need, it's not about perfection, it's about progress on a bumper sticker. So I'm just going to put that out there if anyone wants to create it. Or does it oh, already? Yes. I don't know. I have to say it is not my word. Pretty sure Jeremy Jones said that. <laughs> so I'll, yeah, might want to have a little caveat. Maybe, maybe it is a bumper sticker. We got to find it. It's yeah. I think it's really impactful. <laughs> It really is because it, it it's the little wins, right? And that shows up not just in fundraising, but it shows up in life. People are motivated when it's a little win. It's not this avalanche that you have to get through. Um, I There's so much that you said in that that I want to pull out in particular around the advocacy and um, a nonprofit correlation. But I'd love, Erica, Mark, if you have anything you want to add in this idea of kind of donor fatigue um, and why it does or doesn't exist. Yeah, I would add something, you know, um, when we think about philanthropy or the act of giving in general, it's a very human experience. And, um, you know, philanthropy itself, the word is love of humankind. Um, And so it is really something that comes from the heart. And so when we think about the practice, it's really a practice, the practice of philanthropy. Um, We want to be constantly thinking about how are we speaking to the hearts of our donors, you know, when we think about creating policy change in the world. How are we thinking about how lives are being changed and therefore why do the hearts of the people who are going to be impacted by that policy. um, Why are those front and center for us when we think about the ask that we're putting out there for our donors to participate in because we want their heart to be the thing that leads them to making that gift. Um, And so, you know, when we think about the, I think it's important, um, you know, one of the elements of a really positive philanthropic culture can be storytelling because storytelling is the thing that really gets people in touch with the heart of your mission. You know, how are lives being impacted? How is the world being changed? And so, When you see that um, and a donor is in touch with that, those stories are being told, hopefully not just by your fundraising people, but your fundraising people can be thinking about, all right, where are the great stories? How do I get those stories in front of the donor so that they're hearing this great content or they're hearing the thing that happened yesterday right in our lobby? Um, Those are the things that speak to a person's heart and get them to think about how they can participate and be involved in one of the ways is Uh, by giving philanthropically. Yes, brilliant. Erica, anything on your end? I was just sitting and, you know, thinking about what you've both said, just taking it a step further. I, when I think back to my nonprofit time and what I would do now if I were approaching Giving Tuesday, and if I were able to build these communities that you're talking about, deeply connected, emotionally connected to the work that's being done by these incredible leaders, I think that I would have approached it with also a mindset of how can I also give these people the tools that they need to share this mission, to be able to dip into other communities, maybe even like-minded individuals who can see that connection and maybe empathize with that as well. That idea of like peer-to-peer outreach in this season would be so intriguing. Um, so yeah, I, I maybe would pass the torch to the viewers and, and let us know how you're going to approach it. Yes, peer to peer. It's it all. It all boils down to the ability to connect through story. Mark, thank you for bringing that to it. But also, if I have a human connection, I'm going to be more likely to share and say, "Hey, I really care about X organization. Would you consider joining me at the event or donating or whatever it is?" Um, So this idea of advocacy and fundraising, there's a lot of different kind of like academic schools of thought on why advocacy is not connected to fundraising and why are they they are separate things. There is a whole school of thought on why they benefit each other and how in particular policy change can really be the core of what some nonprofits are doing. Um, I think as we've kind of moved into the post-COVID era, people have gotten a lot more comfortable with being online and things constantly um, being kind of pushed in front of them, being on a webinar, right, as opposed to being being in a room uh, for this type of conversation. And I think advocacy has become more easy to engage with, in particular legislative advocacy, right, contacting your reps, telling them you care about something. 
And when you look at that in conjunction with fundraising efforts, I'm really curious, uh, Karen, if, if y'all have seen that there's a correlation between people who give and people who take a- action, like legislative action. And what does that look like? Are, are there different levels of engagement or paths of engagement that you take people on if they've you know done legislative advocacy first or if they've donated first? Like, is there a kind of a strategy between your donors and your advocates or people who advocate on your behalf? Oh, that is such a great question and something that I think we're really still learning about and and trying to navigate. Um, And I don't know how deep I can get into that because we are very in our learning stages of it. But what I do really recognize within our community is um, and quite honestly, this is what brought me in as a member to POW is that when I first heard of what Protect Our Winters was, it was in 2018 at the Banff Mountain Film Festival. It was a fireside chat, super relaxed conversation. And we were discussing how, or I guess they were discussing, I was not a part of it at that point. <laughs> um, they were discussing how really it's about a numbers game when it comes to policy change, when it comes to policy impact. We as a POW community, could all come together and it's as simple as giving your name and email so that when they would go forward to government officials and say, hey, we have 32,000 people that strongly believe this. It is so impactful because we can add our name to the voice. So when it comes to POW, when it comes to our approach, for us, membership growth is so important and it is as simple as just adding your email to our membership to our list there it doesn't take anything else to be a member but what that also means on a fundraising side is that not only do we have this growing list of Canadians that feel passionately about climate advocacy climate action and we can take this list forward to whomever we're having that discussion with We also have the opportunity to reach out to these individuals and say, hey, we love that you care about this. We love that you're aligned. And by the way, we're coming to Calgary, Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, and we're hosting a season opener. And we would love for you to come and celebrate, get your skis waxed, um, enjoy some films and listen to athletes, Olympic athletes discuss what it means to be a climate advocate to them and have this educational opportunity. And to me, those two things are so beautiful because not only has this individual supported us by adding their email and being a member, but they also have the option to connect with like-minded people and celebrate on site and meet these very inspirational people and be inspired and further inspire as well. And usually they don't even think about the $15, $20 ticket that's involved. That is fundraising and they're getting so much value out of it and they feel like they're a part of the community. And that's where I think those those things align for us. I can't speak on behalf of the entire organization. I'm also not in um, the legal side of things, the more so advocacy side of things. I am very much so in the fundraising side, but from my lens, that is where our, our efforts are very much so aligned. And quite honestly, I know that if I've done my job right, the individual that did pay money to attend this event doesn't feel like they have just been asked to support us financially. Instead, they receive and feel included and they have received more than they have given. And that to me is successful community-based fundraising. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I just jump in there? Because you mentioned message fatigue earlier and I think act or, or uh, donor fatigue earlier. And I actually think it's message fatigue. You know, when you feel included Um, When the message that comes to you or the ask that comes to you is more about you being involved, um, no one tires of getting messages like that. There may be only a certain amount of dollars that you're able to give, but no one's going to turn away a strong message that helps you to feel included and involved. Yes. I was actually going to come to you, Mark, just to hear about what advocacy looked like in your previous roles and and what it looks like right now when you're working with customers around the globe on tying advocacy to fundraising or is it not even coming up? 
Yeah, I mean, I think they're the thing that is going on for so many of us. There's so much change that's happening in the world right now. And I think we're all kind of responding to what that change feels like. Um, that change can feel like something that makes us feel afraid. Um, it can be something that makes us feel hopefully inspired. Um, but it's, you know, change is something that our brains are just hardwired to kind of put up walls against. And so, um, you know, when, when I think about the way that people are feeling from a giving standpoint, I think it's really important to fight that um, brain body connection and really get into the heart. Um, it, it is the thing that matters in, in giving conversations. Um, you know, when we think about relationships with people, it's driven by where our heart is going. And so um, when it comes to advocacy and fundraising, I think that's the thing that we constantly have to be careful about. I see a lot of messaging. Um, I, mean, I think we all get messaging into our inboxes, regardless of what your political affiliations are or whatever. A lot of those messages can be things that make you feel afraid or make you feel scared. And um, it's important for us always when we think about the quality of our messaging um, and we think about the campaigns that we're putting out into the world that we're asking people to participate in, um, one of the best services that we can provide the people as leaders is to inspire, to reach for the heart, to think about the, the positive impact that we want to make in the world and ask people to join us and participate in that. And I think the, the most effective campaigns do that really well. Mm, absolutely. Erica, I'd love your insights on how you're seeing this show up kind of in the social media sphere as a, a part of, of your role here at Nation Builder and I know in, in other jobs. Are you seeing nonprofits kind of dip themselves in and out of advocacy and fundraising? Are they kind of seamlessly together? Like, what does that look like right now in on the social side? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think that there's a lot more alignment in that world, kind of like Karen was saying, than we've maybe paid attention to before. Um, there's there's so many little buttons and and honestly even just platforms for people to take action for them to post out that link of what they really want them to do. There's also so many trends to be able to share your mission, share your story. Um, so many places for you to post clips to share what that looks like from the you know World Wide Web. Um, and so I, I think that while there is so much alignment there, there's also that edge of competition. And so. Um, I think that what I'm noticing, especially like from our customers, they see so much impact being able to not only have that message of advocacy across their social media, but that it's followed up on their website. It's followed up in their other communications that all of these different edges of marketing are all working together to help support that message, continue that story and kept, keep bringing people in that invitation, that opportunity that Kieran and Mark keep talking about being able to present it as easily as possible you know, there's this, uh, there's a lot of messages out there, especially around this time of year. So being able to just share that really transparently and, and effectively really quickly is what I'm seeing be so beneficial for our customers. Absolutely. Yeah. And that key of, of actually owning the relationship once it comes back. Um, okay. Well, I am going to pass the mic over to the wonderful Karen to just give us an overview of what is happening right now with Protect Our Winters and share her point of view. So I am going to make sure that you are pinned here doing this live and the mic and the share screen is yours. Amazing. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, I'm just going to triple check that you can see the POW logo on screen. Awesome. It's that or my email inbox. So I'm really glad that that was what was successful there. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of this. I love these kind of discussions and I love when we can start to think beyond a box of here's Giving Tuesday. This is on Tuesday after we've spent all our money. And how can we further that? How can we grow that? How can we make this an opportunity to go beyond and um, be a part of our community throughout the year? And so I am really, really amazingly grateful to be a part of the community of Protect Our Winters Canada. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I actually came to a POW talk 
It was a very relaxed chat with some of their athletes at the Banff Mountain Film Festival back in 2018. And what caught my eye and really drew me in to put my email down and therefore be a part of the community, because it was as simple as that, um, was the fact that they aren't looking for someone that's a perfect climate advocate, environmentalist. I didn't need to be on it recycling all the time or have zero plastic or um, have all of these perfection elements to my climate advocacy and my climate action to be a part of this community and to feel supported and to be able to feel a part of something bigger. And that's what drew me in. Um, POW Canada is a community of, a, a very passionate community of outdoor enthusiasts, professional athletes, um, industry brands. We're all uniting in advocacy and policy change for climate change. And I think that that's really incredible to see these brand efforts, these athlete efforts, um, and outdoor enthusiasts all come together at all of these different levels to say, hey, we are seeing change in the places that we love, and we are here to protect them. So we are a community of a whole bunch of different outdoor enthusiasts, no matter where we're coming from, whether we love to walk outdoors, breathe outdoors, um, or adventure outdoors, we've all come together to advocate for policy change. And it really started back in 2007 in the United States with Jeremy Jones. Jeremy Jones, if you're not familiar, um, he is a professional snowboarder. He is um, actually probably why I wanted to snowboard, just incredible big lines, well known in the industry. And he was seeing massive change in the places where he loved to snowboard. And he wanted to bring together athletes and different outdoor um, individuals to really advocate for action. And that kind of started ballooning out into different areas around the world, bringing in Protect Our Winters. So Protect Our Winters Canada is separate from the one in the United States, but we all are under that POW umbrella. And we believe that our love of adventure in nature demands our participation in the fight to save and protect it. Whether we like to walk our dog outside, breathe clean air, or crush a mad line, snowboarding, skiing, chasing snow, whatever that means, our love for the outdoors really is just, it's, it. we need to protect it and we need to do more. But at the baseline of who we are, we are a community. We are a collective of individuals that have all put their names forward to say we are aligned in this vision to see climate advocacy um, really follow through all the way to those, those higher levels of government policy. We have 32,000 members and growing here in Canada, and we started in 2018. So we're a little bit behind the, the POW US team, um, but we came to Canada here in, in 2018 and, and have already grown to 32,000 members across the country and are wanting to grow more. And our three main efforts are really in inspiration, education, and advocacy. So we aim to inspire through those community events, events really bring people in, really build that community. We also do education. So we have Hot Planet Cool Athletes going to different school groups. Uh, we have educational events, and then we advocate. We bring different athletes and scientists together, and we go to Ottawa. We have these big conversations with municipal, local, um, as well as federal government individuals and really try and advocate that change and and really try and bring together all of these scientific and athletic minds and and um, really drive that change from a multifaceted approach. If we're looking at where we are we are now as well, I mean climate anxiety is a topic or even just like a common conversation that I have never heard so much in the past. Uh, by September 5th, this year here in Canada, there were over 6,100 fires that were recorded this year alone. And that continued forward. That was the last data as, as of September 5th that we had. And that is immense. It is, we broke records this year. We had smoke everywhere. We are all very aware of where our climate is at and the urgency to protect it. Um, but when we're looking at our name, Protect Our Winters, and, and also our baseline where a lot of us have come from, a lot of that has to do with 
wanting to protect the sports that we love and the adventure that we love. And, and we recognize how big of an impact losing our winters, losing our ski seasons can be, but we also love our ski seasons. And what we're seeing is those opening days and those closing days are getting closer and closer together. I know that I'm a part of a nonprofit ski hill in BC here, and we couldn't open, usually we open at the beginning of December, we couldn't open until mid-January last year. Their ski seasons are getting shorter. We have less snow on the mountain and that impacts our summer and our winter, our just global, our earth's health in general. And it is so important to recognize that these changes are happening and how they're impacting us. Um, we really start to go into, especially with our ties with these incredible scientists that are a part of our science alliance, we're able to really see the differences and dive into what that means. And what we're seeing is that if we continue down this trajectory, we are going to have shorter and shorter ski seasons every single year. So what we're looking at is even if we're looking at Ontario, we are looking like at the ski season length is actually shrinking from where it was in the 2000s all the way down to two or the 2080 mark is going to be less than a month of ski season available in those in those areas. So we are losing our ability to have snow on the ground for longer. And this is really urgent. So we do have to act now, not only to save our hills, but to also save our summers and save the water that we have and just so many other facets because a lot of that starts in the winter. It's not about me changing my light bulb and therefore I have the impact that's going to save our winter. <laughs> it is about changing policy and that's why numbers are so important. We have power when we're together. Our impact is so much greater when we can work together. And there is also power and positivity. Never before have we seen so much climate anxiety, so much like there, there's so many feelings of we need like almost a loss of hope that's ringing throughout the community and I just want to also really have a moment here to transition and feel that power and positivity because without hope, we don't often move forward with, um, I don't want to say vengeance, but that's in my head right now, with, with passion. We need that hope. We need that positivity. And a lot of that positive com positivity comes in that inspirational community effort of uniting us with like-minded people. So we have to remember to join those events connect with those individuals, share our name and, and grow the numbers that POW represents so that we can unite together, be positive together, find that hope so that we are driving forward that change together. So how are we achieving this change in general is through your support. For POW, the biggest thing is becoming a member. It is as simple as, as I was discussing earlier as sharing your email address and your name so that our numbers grow and we can go to Ottawa and say this is how many people care your support in just even as small as giving an email really drives action forward but as I said earlier I mean it's so important to recognize that when we're talking about fundraising when we're talking about community action and community inspiration that as email and membership, it's just a baseline for us to grow and unite together. And I think that if you're a fundraiser coming into your organization and you have an uh, um, easier way to connect with individuals, that is the way to do it. That is the way to start to grow and amplify and build your community. Because not only are we saying and are we able to say that it's as easy as giving an email and, and your name, but we can also say that just doing that is aligning us in our values. It's driving action forward. And we start to really see that inspiration shine through in all of our community. Um, that last one was more relevant for those that are joining us in the Calgary event today, which I will be using this presentation again. But I hope until then we see you on the Hill and we see you um, in different facets of POW. And I'm really grateful that I could share the POW story with you all today. Yes. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate it. I'd love to just ask if you could share with the audience on how has Nation Builder actually helped to provide everything that you just shared with us on the POW side of things? Like, what are you using? What features? And, and how is it supporting the infrastructure? I am really excited because I 
just am realizing now that I forgot to mention something that I really, really love about Nation Builder. Um, we are new into utilizing a leaderboard aspect within Nation Builder. And I think that that's a really important thing that I have forgotten to mention. Um, but our leaderboard is specific for our Game On program. And I'll get into what Game On is in a moment. But what's important to recognize about Game On is that fundraising cannot actually be connected to our leaderboard in any way. We cannot get we cannot have someone raising in points based on how much they give as per a CRA regulation um, because we are handing out prizes based on their points. So we can't hand out prizes based on how much people are giving financially. So that removes our leaderboard from our fundraising efforts. But in my opinion, it is so instrumental in fundraising for POW. And I quote it like this, because in my mind, fundraising is a very linear, very wide, very human approach on the POW side. So what we do with game on is game on is a way that we have um created positivity around climate action we've gamified but climbing becoming a climate advocate so you can win points in your leaderboard for doing a challenge so maybe that is um collecting a bag of garbage or you can win points for bringing people in as members you can win points uh for attending a free event or it, there's just so many different ways where you win points and we encourage that engagement with our individuals we also have chapters across Canada. We have about 15 chapters run by volunteers and volunteers for spending their time with us and, and sharing the POW voice, they get points. And what I really want to recognize there is people give how they can give and how it aligns with them. Some of our volunteers also donate, but a lot of our volunteers are donating through the time that they're giving. Time is so valuable. And what we've done is we've made it fun to be a part of our community, you can win prizes, you can be involved in this ladder of engagement has just really created um, an actionable membership engagement platform for people to enjoy. And we have a lot of learning yet to do. We have a lot of um, internal on the POW side, internal kinks to figure out as we're introducing new challenges every month and really trying to sustain and grow game on. And that's like a whole other conversation. But what I love about it and what I think is really unique to Nation Builder for us here at POW is it allows for us to connect with our community so much further than finances and marketing messaging. It allows for us to activate in a really fun, positive, inspiring way, which is just so true to our roots and our core. Mm. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, okay. I would love to just get closing thoughts from each of you. Uh, and so I will I'll kick off with you, Erica. If there is one thing that everyone who has tuned in to this lovely webinar today that they would take away with for them, right, that you have shared or that you haven't shared yet, what is one piece of advice that you would give to people thinking about fundraising or getting involved um, in fundraising? I think that first, it's really important to just shake the pressure off, like lose the expectations of what other people have done and even what like your top goal could possibly be and dig into your strengths, dig into where your community, where, where you need that involvement, where you need to equip and empower people to get more involved or um, to share your message or um, to get involved in a, in a different or unique way. Um, I think that this idea of giving Tuesday is this like large campaign um, that we all need to survive, you know, that nonprofits need to, you know, hit the, make their mission, um, make other people learn about their mission or um, emphasize the work that they're trying to do. But I think that what we all can recognize is that Giving Tuesday, the idea of that campaign is something that can happen any day you want to put your mind to it. There are digital tools out there to help you save time um, and focus on the things you truly care about and, and need to work on. So uh, my biggest, I don't know, word of encouragement would be to just like lean into who you are um, and, and the impact that you can have. It's unique and special and it's needed. Um, that's mine. Uh, Shy popcorn. Ooh, I'll popcorn to Mark. 
Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, well, you know, one of the things that we teased heading into this webinar was, you know, this is prime real estate when we think about giving um, end of the year. So when we think about Giving Tuesday, we think about everything that needs to happen between now and the end of the year. You're in that critical phase in fundraising where it's important to segment your audience and think about, you know, being ruthless with your time. Um, how can I have the biggest impact from a fundraising standpoint with the time that I have between now and the end of the year? That's the mindset of a gift officer this time of year. So hopefully you have the tech tools that you need to segment your audiences, segment your donor list, and really think about attacking that. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I want to take, uh, have people take away is long-term, be thinking about your organization's philanthropic culture, which just generally is your organization's attitude toward fundraising and donor relationships, because uh, positive philanthropic culture is really the engine that drives fundraising, and especially fundraising uh, with major gifts philanthropy. Um, you know, you want to be thinking about how can everyone in the organization have a role to play? You know, how can I delegate leadership in my fundraising efforts, get everyone to understand that they have a job to, to uh, perform and there are certain things that they're accountable to that align with the gifts that they have within the organization? Um, not a, everyone thinks that fundraising has to be about asking, but uh, everyone has a role to play that's suited to what their unique gifts are. And so give people a job, move them to take action, delegate that leadership so that it's not just falling only on one person to raise uh, the profile of your fundraising as an organization. And think about what your culture is internally and nurture that um, in 2024. Karen. Oh, that's a hard one to follow up with. That really drove home so much. Um, I love it. And in effort of trying not to repeat anything or just sit here and be like, oh, what they said. <laughs> um, yeah, I love that approach of recognizing. I mean, we are a small team a small but mighty team when it comes to POW, um, when it comes to some of the other nonprofits that I've either consulted with or worked with or have been a part of. It's not always a massive team where you have so many different people in the fundraising department pushing forward. So I love that approach of, of recognizing the value that each team member has and really moving forward as a team. Um, and then what I love about being small and being human um, and having that human approach is something that I've kind of said over and over again, but maybe I'll, I'll end with this is just to remember that you're talking to humans and you're, you're bringing in humans and that connection on a human to human scale is really important. And if you have the beauty of being a small team, also the, the burden of being a small team, it's hard, but if you have the beauty of being a small team, it's easier to remember it's a human to human contact, but sometimes as you grow, it's harder to remember that. And I just encourage everyone to remember that human to human contact and in such a heavy world right now that that positive approach really goes far. If you can share where you're aligned in values and share your positive approach to things, I think that um, you're going to see, not only are you going to see change, but you're also going to be seeing a long-term emotional connection through change. It's not, I have an extra five bucks, I'm going to donate that five bucks. It is I care about this, I will find that $5. I will go to that event because I can't miss out on it because I am aligned on a value and emotional level. So yeah, taking that human team and connecting with the humans that are part of your larger family, I think is a really important approach. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. I have really appreciated um, the last 53 minutes. Uh so we do have a couple of minutes here for questions if folks want to uh, pop them in the chat. The other thing I will note for, for those who are with us on um, here on Zoom and, and live, 
We do have a uh, product demonstrations. Um, I saw some notes come in around kind of getting more in depth in our platform. Um, we do have those every Tuesday and Thursday. So if you want to kind of get a little bit more into, into the weeds on how Nation Builder can support your fundraising infrastructure, please join us. Our amazing organizing team uh, hosts those every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, so please join there. And then we will be having a much more product oriented um, giving channel. Tuesday end of year type of content that will be taking place later in November with our enterprise account management team, uh, where they'll be taking you through fundraising on the platform and, and kind of doing some screen shares. So if you want to join either of those, you'll see them in nishamilder.com backslash webinars. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. Appreciate it. And have an amazing end of year giving season and Karen, good luck tonight at your, your event. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to be with us. You bet. Thank you for having me. This was, this was really fun. I loved it. Amazing. All right. Bye folks.